Hey everyone, welcome back to the next module in the Ultimate Denver House Hacking course. This is the fifth module, and this one will be talking about maximizing rent for your house hack while you're living there, and then also once you move out. So we'll run through uh, different types of rental strategies that you can use in the current Denver rental market. So you got me here. My name is Chris Lopez again. I'm a real estate agent at Yourcast Real Estate. I help people buy, sell uh, rental properties. I got Mr. Joe Massey here with me, who's a senior loan officer at Castle and Cook, who does all the lending. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. How are you today? Great to be here, Chris. Thanks so much for putting this together, man. Yeah, as you mentioned, I work for Castle and Cook Mortgage, uh, senior loan officer, branch manager, wear a number of hats. But uh, the most important thing that I do is help people buy homes, uh, whether that's their primary residence, house hacks, investment properties, and uh, help people make money in real estate. So really excited to be here today chatting with you guys. And I'm really excited for our third presenter, uh, Mr. Jeff White, because he is really going to be an expert in this module. So I'm excited for what I'm going to learn. I don't have to do much today other than sit back and listen. So Jeff, how are you today? Doing well. Thanks for the intro, Joe. My name is Jeff White. I'm an active Denver house hacker and also house hacking coach that helps out people that are just beginning uh, with their first house hack, second house hack, or just need help with whatever, whatever problem they're currently having with their current house hack and everything in between. So I'm excited to be here, Chris and Joe, and uh, let's get rolling. Sounds good, guys. All right, so a very big thing we want to talk about while we're discussing uh, this module and all the other ones is there's two ways to look at maximizing rent while you're house hacking. There's the first scenario, which is while you're living there. And remember, this is the first scenario because it's a house hack. And per the rules of lending guidelines, you have to live in the property within 60 days and live there for one year. So figuring out the rent while you live there is a must. And then there's the figuring out the rent after you move out. Now, Jeff, I'm going to ask you this question because you've got a good investing experience during your third house hack. Which is more important? Is it getting better rent while you live there or better rent for once you move out? After you move out, that's the key number because you're not, most likely you're only going to be there one to two years. Um, and the key number is how much, what is your what your numbers look like the day you move out and rent whatever space you're currently in, whether that's a room or a unit and making sure your numbers work there. I, I 100% agree because we're buying house hacks or people buy house hacks. It's because it's a great way to build a future rental portfolio. So you want to make sure it makes sense as a good rental property. But of course, you have to live there for that year as well. So let's dive into some different ways you can start making money with your house hack. And we'll talk about it You know, while you're living there. And as Jeff said, most importantly, once you move out. Uh, so I would say the most common saying, thing we're seeing in Denver right now, as far as like the sweet spot for maximizing rent to price ratio is renting room by room. Jeff, why don't you take the lead on this one? Because uh, you're just crushing it with this. Yeah. So this is definitely part of my recent strategy because... It just makes more sense, especially if you find a place that has a lot of bedrooms and bathrooms. And actually, let me let me uh, interrupt you here. Just I want to paint people the picture to kind of make sure everyone understands your your background because you you did the like the textbook example house hack for your first property. You bought yeah. a fourplex. Um, you lived in one unit and you're at the other three units, uh, which is we know that's a the textbook example. You used an FHA loan when it came to buy the next property. Joe said, oh, you want to buy a multi-unit? You got to put 15 or 20% down at least. But then you bought a house and you put 5% down, right? Yep. And, and this then, is where it made sense to rent room by room. Yeah. So that one, it was actually um, a house with a mother-in-law and it had, um, up, it was kind of already similar to a up, down, duplex kind of separated out, but a, just a single family house. Yep. So I did a combination of strategies. So I rented the upstairs to a family. And then the downstairs was another three bedrooms, um, three bed, two bath upstairs, three bed, one bath downstairs. Um, instead of, you know, I, I had to live somewhere. So I live in the basement. Um, and then the other two, so that was one room. And then the other two rooms, I just decided like, let's do a combo strategy here. So had the stability of upstairs of a longer term lease of the family that probably will stick around longer. And then the rooms are more young professionals between, I would say, the demographic was 25, 35. Um, 
and people, you know, just want to save money on rent. That's why people rent by the room. They don't want to pay that, you know, the average one bedrooms, 12 to 1600 bucks in Denver Metro. So what are that. the yeah, typical rents like for room by room rentals? Yeah, exactly. We see on the slides here, 700 to 850 for me personally, I'm more in the 750 range on average. Um, and yeah, absolutely. The, if you have private bathrooms, you could probably add extra $1,500 um, per month to that number. So between 800, 850. Um, so like a master, uh, bedroom with bathroom, you could probably get that close to that 850 range, but it just, uh, run in the mill 10 by 12, 10 by 11 by 13 type of bedroom is closer to that 700, 750 range. And from what I've seen from just, you know, researching it and just working with a lot of clients, uh, the rental room rates seem fairly static around Denver Metro. I mean, yeah. Have you noticed a big swing in difference between the areas you've lived and researched? No, I mean, like from what I've experienced and talked to other investors is, yeah, that that typical range, 700, 850. Yeah, you could probably get a little higher, you know, if you're in a popular, like Sloan's Lake, Highlands, down like near near downtown, Cap Hill area, maybe a little bit higher. But the reality is you're, whether you live Cap Hill or, you know, the like a Lakewood area, you're probably about that 700, uh, 750 range for a room, just because there's not like the same amount of spread because it's just a room. So there's not like this, the location doesn't really make that much more uh, a value for just a room versus like a whole unit by itself. And so. the reason we don't buy or house hackers don't buy a lot of properties in those, you know, the cap hill and those areas is because yeah, you can maybe get another $50, $100 a month in rent, but the problem is the purchase price is going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars more. So going back to one of our earlier modules talking about that rent to price ratio. Um, great. You can get more rent on there, but then your rent to price ratio is a lot lower than buying houses like this. And what we're talking is really anything but like core downtown Denver, Aurora, Thornton, Westminster, Lakewood, Arvada, uh, Littleton. It all usually falls in that 700 to 850 range a month per room. And uh, Jeff, what would you say, walk us through a good place to, to find comps when people are researching this, like yeah. room by room comps. So the two you listed, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist are great. Uh, Facebook Marketplace does more of a visual, like little tiles, think of like little pictures. And you could like see, okay, where's, um, you could type in different, you could put like a zip code locator and you could put like a radius going out. And then kind of find what's near there. Um, and a big thing, and then Craigslist, the thing with Craigslist, I would say not so much for listing your property, but just to get more market research. And you could see, you could actually, they have a map feature at Craigslist, and you could look up room rentals for, um, you could zoom out and find out like where they're all located, what rent they're trying to get. Doesn't mean they're actually getting it, but you could look at the date that the posting was listed and just you know doing your own research a lot of this too is just playing around with it i think the big thing is you have to really have good pictures and a, like a very you know straightforward listing description because you only have someone's attention for probably 10 to 20 seconds if they click on your listing so you got to really sell it <clears throat> to get them to contact you and want to go see it and that's something that you'll be teaching in a future module. We'll be doing a very deep dive on on how to do that and also help people with as well. So if you guys want to learn those details on getting those clicks and phone calls and showings and renters, check out you know uh, a future module on there where Jeff is telling us how to do that. So Jeff, how do you tell these work uh, in these room by room rental situations? Yeah, what I've encountered is I know there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, some people build back, they get like utility bill and build back, say, okay, split four ways, five ways. Problem with that is it's a hassle sometimes to, at least what I've encountered, to chase after $30, $50 for utilities if you ever, you know, break them out five ways. <laughs> So instead of doing that, I just bake it into the um, rent. So I do like $700 a month plus $50 for utilities. And I just look at the average utility bill the last 12 months or try to find that data from the um, previous owner and kind of do like a average and say, okay, what's the average divided by four, divided by five, um, and then just add that to the rent so they don't have to worry about it. You don't have to like chase after them for 30 bucks. Um, and then 
some months you'll be good. Like you'll say, okay, I made, I covered the whole utility. Some months might feel a little off if, you know, like in the winter when they're using more heat or someone uses a shower a lot and they use a ton of water. So you might be a little bit off, but overall you'll probably be even like they'll cover the utilities in their rent. And I, I will definitely second following your strategy there on doing, you know, hey, you have your base rent amount and then add a separate utility amount on the lease on top there. So it says, hey, the rent is $700 a month plus utilities an extra $50 a month. Uh, even just not doing the room by room rentals, that by far is the most common way landlords structure utilities and leases uh, with all with their typical long term tenants. And it's just said, like, normally the averages, you know, it's going to average up pretty well. You know, it might swing 30 or 50 bucks one way or the other a month here and there, but it averages out. And a key point here to know is, like, when you charge for utilities, that's not meant to be a profit center. That's truly meant to just offset common utilities where you can't separate them out and bill those tenants directly. What about offering, like, amenities like Wi-Fi, common areas, things like that? Yeah. So another big thing too is same thing with the wi the Wi Fi is you can say okay get your own, but the problem is we can have four different people with four different routers and all that in one house. That's kind of uh, be a little crazy mess there with four different connections. So to simplify things, just uh, you should offer as like one of the extra benefits of renting by the room is especially because the demographic that you most people are interested. You know, they you know, probably stream a lot. They use the internet for their work, for at home. So just offer it as part of kind of like it's include, baked it into the rent. And maybe you could average, put that in there too. Say, okay, you know, my utility bill is 50 bucks a month. Divide that by five people. So you got 10 bucks a month and then throw that part of utilities or just bake it in. It's something you should provide because I think it's uh, something that adds value. And they will have that at the competition to a lot of competitors uh, that do rent by the room also offer Wi-Fi part of the, as like a service. And everyone, I mean, the reality is just everyone wants Wi-Fi now. It is almost like yeah. it's a special, special <laughs> service, just like, you know, gas, and electricity, maybe not quite as life, you know, necessity, but it's, you know, people need their work and their network. <clears throat> and then other things, oh yeah, considerations. Um, another big thing to think about is with renting by the room, you do want to furnish the common areas. You do want to provide cabinet space um, in like the living room. Um, don't expect like what could happen sometimes is some people will like, oh, I got my own couch. So I want to bring that in. But if you do all that, if you furnish all the common areas, you have a dining room table, you have a couch, you have a TV or dining room table, um, you know, nights, uh, different um like furnishings and provide all the dishes and plates and pots and pans and silverware, then all that they really have is their food and then what's in the room. So thinking long term, uh, something happened where you know you had they stopped paying rent and you had to evict them. Worst case scenario, all they all the all it is is what the possessions is in the room, not in the main living area. So that makes it really simple. Worst case, thinking worst case, but. Um, and also makes it simple too for moving in, moving out. They don't have to worry about, oh, I gotta get all my dishes, I have to get all the stuff, my couch, you know, all they have is what they have in the room. So it makes it really seamless when it comes to moving out when that time comes. And you'll, uh, I think the plan is here in the future module, you, you'll give us a detailed checklist and step by step oh, yeah. guidelines what to do for all, all right, cool. Yep. Um, so a couple of things to think about here um, is occupancy limits. Um, you know, if you're renting room by room, uh, different municipalities, and that changes from the county to maybe the city you're living in, a lot of them have different rules for how many unrelated people can live together. Uh, a lot of times it's three to five unrelated people um, per municipality. We're not going to list them off here because there's a lot of a lot of places around Denver, and sometimes they do change. Uh, currently, like right now, we were talking about this last week, Jeff. Um, there's a proposal to I think it's the Denver City Council or whatever body takes care of that, uh, but to raise the occupancy limits to eight unrelated people, right? Yeah, yeah. Which uh, I think currently right now it's uh, two unrelated parties for a single family house in Denver with without a permit and then if you get a permit you can get one more person so going from two to eight is extreme i think it'll probably be somewhere in the middle there yeah yeah 
And so this is something you guys always want to check out when you're buying your place. And then, you know, here's reality too. A lot, you know, some landlords follow those rules, some don't. That's for you to decide. But we always want to make sure you know those rules because um, there's always that chance that uh, the city or county or wherever you live can say, hey, you know what? <clears throat> The neighbor reported something or your tenants, you know, pissed off the neighbors. Oh, you've got more than four people here. Uh, that's above the occupancy limits. You need to change this. So definitely understand that those are rules there and that there's a risk to reward. Because obviously, the more people are living in a, in a house, the better your rent is. Uh, but depending where that house is, you may be over the occupancy limit. Another thing with room by room rentals is not so much while you're living there, but once you move out is property management. Uh, property managers, for the most part, they don't want to handle room by room rentals because it's going to just it, it just doesn't make sense for their model. They're doing traditional, you know, one lease to one tenant to one unit situation, not four leases to individuals in one property. So while you're living in the property and once you move out of the property, it's going to be for the most part, you are managing it and it's going to be more management intensive. And fortunately, Jeff will walk us through those details here in a future a couple of future modules. Uh, so, Joe, I got a question here for you that this pops up when we teach, yeah. you know, our house hacking class here. This pops up almost every single time. So um, if I if uh, I'm renting a house, I got three roommates on here <clears throat> paying me rental income. Can I use my roommate's income to count as income towards my next uh, house hack purchase? Yes. With a couple of caveats. <clears throat> Number one, you need to be claiming it on your tax returns. Right. So um, one thing that always makes it really great to work with Jeff is uh, he understands the value of tracking all the information. He understands the value of putting all that information on his tax returns so that then we can use that rental income to help him qualify for the next property. One of the things that I'll see people trip themselves up is they'll rent out three or four rooms and they just have their roommates pay them in cash. They don't claim it on their tax returns. They're like, oh man, this is fantastic uh, because I'm making all this money, not paying taxes on it. Well, that works out great right up until it's time to buy the next property. Um, so you should be claiming that income on your tax returns. Um, you should also have written leases. If you're not claiming it on your tax returns and you've just recently rented out the property, there are some uh, loopholes that we can use to help with that, but you've gotta have a written lease and you've gotta have, um, uh, security deposit check or recent rent check showing that you are now receiving rental income for that property. So what I would tell you, um, and I talk about this in a lot of our classes, um, report your income, pay your taxes. Yes, I know it stinks, but put it on your tax returns, do it properly, and it's going to help you finance the next property. So the short answer is yes, you can do it. The long answer is keep really good records and make sure you claim all the income. And this is just another reason to make sure, I mean, hopefully you work with, you know, me, Joe and Jeff with your house hacking stuff, whether you do or you don't, this is just one of those important little details as to why you want to work with professionals that understand the house hacking chess game. Because if you don't count that income and the year later, great, you might be saving a few bucks in taxes, but if you shoot yourself in your foot and you can't buy the next property, I'm pretty certain that that not buying the next property is going to hurt your income a lot more than saving a few dollars on taxes. So understanding right. these, all these details is a really important thing as you put together your first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth rental uh, properties. So Joe and Jeff, I should say, Jeff, anything you want to say more about room by room rentals before, before we move on to the next slide? Yeah, no, it's uh, set the expectations up front. Um, and if you have a clean furnished area, People will act like adults and keep it clean. If you set the example yourself, I think that's the big thing. Set the example. If you're messy yourself, then they won't care and then they won't clean it. But if you have a clean um, place, they'll respect it and keep it clean. And then you won't have to hire a cleaner every month <laughs> to come there and clean it up uh, messes because tenants you know, won't take care of it as much as you will. Just the reality. for it. Great. And uh, one last thing I'll throw in here is that if you look at like a four bedroom you know, house, just keep, keep it right there a comparison. Right now in the Denver market, if you buy a you know, four bedroom, two bathroom, four bedroom, three bathroom type house, the long-term rents on there for one tenant are usually, you know, anywhere from about 22 to the high end about 2,600. So, but if you get a, a four bedroom house, you're not four bedrooms, your rent's gonna be anywhere from, you know, 2,800 to what, 32 or $3,300. So you can see there, that's a, a, a significant rent bump and that's a major reason people do it while they're living there and also once they move out. 
So let's talk about doing short-term rentals or usually what people just refer to as Airbnb. So there's lots of stuff to talk about here. And it's really hard to give you a typical rent range because it's highly, highly dependent on location. You know, we just talked about in the, in the, on the room by room rentals that those rent room or those room rental rates are pretty static around Denver. Airbnb rental rates are very dynamic, meaning that based on the location, even going a few blocks over from one location, you can see a dramatic drop or increase in rents and vacancies and all this stuff. So it's very hard to give you a range on those rents there. So the best thing to do, I mean, of course, you can always go to you know Air, uh, airbnb.com to search around, but there's a tool out there called airdna.co. And it's a third party tool that does a, that you know does a lot of market research. It scrapes information off airbnb.com and it helps you figure out what the rental potential is on those units. So I think uh, I think there is a, a free version on there where you can run some very basic rent reports. Now, something that we have access to uh, is the full subscription model, which is like, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of dollars a month. So a lot of times what we do, if clients are looking at Airbnb, we have access to those more detailed reports so we can always email them out to people. Uh, but again, for a free version, go to airdna.co. If you want a detailed version, uh, reach out to us. We can help you out with that. <clears throat> uh, another thing to keep in mind is that, yes, you will get higher rents on these properties, but they're also a lot of higher operating expenses. Um, just because you're getting an extra, you know, hundred dollars a night, which is way more than you would by renting the house room by room. Um, there's also a lot more work on your part and a lot more expenses with Airbnb fees and cleaning and restocking toilet paper. You're gonna have higher operating expenses. So make sure you really you analyze those numbers uh, because before you jump in here, Jeff, uh, I can tell you the majority of my clients that say, "Hey, I want to buy a place in Airbnb," it once we run the numbers, usually they don't most end up going to doing like a room by room rental model, just because once they get see the income, subtract out the expenses, yeah, they're maybe netting a few hundred dollars more a month. But when they take into account all the extra time and headaches that they have to deal with, they're like, yeah, that's not worth, you know, 20 hours, an extra 20 hours a month for me is not worth an extra three hours a month or whatever it turns out to be. So a lot of our clients end up not doing Airbnb. And the big reason is that it's that, you know, it's not the juice isn't worth the squeeze. And where you get the top Airbnb income rates, a lot of times that's downtown Denver, that's Sloan's Lake, that's the Highlands. Those usually aren't places you're buying house acts because the rental or the purchase prices are so expensive there. So when we are talking about places in the suburbs, we're usually buying house acts, uh, Airbnb rates are usually a lot lower there. So Jeff, I know you've done some Airbnb. Give us your experience on that. Yes, I Airbnb'd a room over at my four unit, actually, a little more creative, uh, combining it with the renting the other units. Um, and that one was really, again, it's uh, similar to the picture, like Airbnb even more so when you don't have a prime location. Uh, and, you know, that property was located in the you know, southwest Denver. Um, you have to sell other things about it. And by doing that, you have to have great pictures very clear and easy to see you have to really give um you know amenities too that's the thing the cost that you're talking about <clears throat> because you're like a mini hotel you have to have like snacks you have to have uh you know someone to come and clean between every single new uh person that comes uh to rent it out um so you have when that turn happens when they do check in check out you have to someone go clean restock uh, toiletries, you know, clean, like wash all the stuff. So your costs are much higher than if you just rented it normally. And it's just a lot more work too, because like you also have to respond, like unless you hire this out, you have to respond to every single person. It's like, oh, how do I get into your, how, where do I park? What's the code to get in? You could set up, there's ways to do automation with that, but you can only answer so many questions because some people are eventually going to say, unless your place is easy to find, easy to park, that's where it's going to be um, a little bit of some issues too. So time, and you can't, that's not in the operating costs, but your time is valuable, especially if you have a full-time job. Um, so oh, some wanna, the, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, because you, they hit a really important point on there is you're, you're running a hospitality business yeah. versus being a landlord. Yep. It's a whole new job. It's a yeah. whole nother world. So unless you have a job where you could go on your phone, 
text people, call people, you know, that it, and usually most jobs, you can't do that frequently <laughs> as much as sometimes when you have a check in, check out. Um, so it makes it challenging sometimes so you have to, like your cleaner person. Also, you have to coordinate with them to make sure they're synced with your calendar. It's a lot. It's running like a, another full time business. So, yes, the uh, as Joe says, you get the higher reward, but also higher time and risk investment, too. So it comes at a cost. So, um, you know, as far as utilities and amenities, pretty similar to what we talked about in the previous uh, section, landlords paying all utilities. And now they're not, you know, you're not going to charge your tenants for four days of utilities use. It's just baked into your into your uh, rent, your nightly or weekly rent you're charging them. You got to provide Wi-Fi and, you know, other amenities, just soap, dishes, uh, furniture, all that stuff. So you're providing, you're paying the utilities and you're providing the amenities. So some considerations to keep in mind, and this is by far the most important one that we're gonna uh, talk about, is you have to know the rules and understand the rules. And that is, you know, the municipality you live in, so Denver, Arvada, wherever you live in, and if you live in a property in an HOA, make sure to understand the HOA rules. So I think it was, Two years ago, um, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was two years ago uh, where Denver passed that rule where it said, hey, if you want to Airbnb it out, it has to be your primary residence. That happened in 20, I think, 18, maybe it's 2017. Yeah, 2018 sometime in that okay. year. Yeah. Um, so fairly recently. And so what was going on is a, you know, a lot of owners had bought houses um, and properties all over town and they were honestly, they were just crushing it because they bought a place, they're Airbnb and they're making a ton of money. Well, then what happened was, you know, between neighbors not really liking it, affordable housing issues, not enough inventory, not enough rental inventory. Uh, Denver said, hey, we need to, it's not intended for all these rental units that used to be for long-term people. It's not meant for them to be, um, you know, used as hotels uh, for private operators. Now, we won't get into politics of what you believe on the app, but that's just the reality of what it is. So a lot of uh, investors kind of got caught in the middle of that. We're like, hey, I've heard people, have, they like had a dozen properties and they had to shift, they had to pivot, they had to sell because the numbers made a lot of sense for what it was like as a Airbnb rental. But as a long-term rental, the numbers didn't work out. So understand the rules. And this is one area you do not want to mess around with. Uh, there's been... Uh, a few cases I can think of just from reading the newspaper, you know, from last year, Denver is cracking down on it. And what they're getting people on is, you know, basically perjury because they're forging documents and saying, oh, yeah, this is my owner. This is my primary residence. And they Photoshop an Excel bill or whatever it is. Well, now you're you're committing fraud to a government entity. Not a great idea. Um And so they are cracking down on it. Um, it's not hard to figure out if it's your primary or not. So I would highly recommend you follow the rules on that and make sure you have a strong plan B in place because maybe Denver doesn't allow it, but this you know neighboring city does. But a lot of municipalities, they're watching Denver and some have started to follow, implement Denver's rules as well. So make sure you understand the rules of, the, of where you live and the rules of the HOA. And regardless, if it makes sense now, have a strong, strong plan B because every Airbnb I've, I've seen so far, most have had to have a plan B. Denver did. Colorado Springs, which used to be a very hot spot to go investing for Airbnb, they passed some rules last year that limited it. So you got to make sure you understand the rules, you play by the rules. And this is one of the things I say when rules change, have a plan B and even a plan C in place. Um, anything else we need to talk about on the short term rental guys? I just have one I want to add where you've got higher operating expenses. You need to factor in higher maintenance costs as well. Maybe not maintenance, but just repairs. Um, one of the things with the folks that I've spent time with that do Air, Airbnb, every tenant that comes in and out, that's basically a move in and out. So you're going to get more scuffs on the wall, more nicks on the corner of you know hallways, more scuffs on the doorway, uh, more broken glasses, more... Uh, silverware that gets thrown in the trash inadvertently. So you need to factor in if you normally have a 5% or 8% for repairs and maintenance, I think it needs to be closer to like 12, 15, maybe 20%. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, 
one of my associates, he does some Airbnb in Vail, and he has really spent probably $15,000 more than he thought um, sort of bulletproofing the unit. You know how when you go into a Marriott, each of the corners in the uh, in the room has like those uh, sort of metal uh, brackets around the corner that prevents the drywall from chipping and, and getting broken. He has that in all of his uh, units and the various corners. So little things that you wouldn't think about you end up doing drywall repairs and more broken light bulbs and more towels that get stolen or lost. So you just need to factor in there's going to be some some operating expenses um, that are going to come off the bottom line. So just don't forget that uh, when you're factoring or when you're running the numbers on Airbnb. Great point. All right, so let's talk about medium-term rentals here. And just to give you guys definitions, so short-term rentals are defined as 30 days or less. Medium-term rentals are anything that's 31 days or more. And so a typical medium term rental is usually like for traveling nurses or corporate housing. So traveling nurses, they typically, you know, move around a city to city and stay there for three months is a very common number or corporate housing for when people are getting relocated or they come work on a project for a few months in the city and they want a fully furnished place that they can live in for two, three or four months. So that's what a medium term rental is. And that they usually are, you know, anywhere from like about one to six months with, you know, three to four being pretty common from what I've heard. And your typical rents, again, highly dependent on your location. If you want to rent towards, you know, traveling nurses, you kind of need to be near hospitals because that's what they go there for typically is hospitals. Um, and so if you want to see some rent comps on there, you can Google it. But I know a very popular website is called furnishedfinder.com. So that's furnished, E-D, finder.com. Um, you can go on there and, and browse some listings on there. Now, generally speaking, you have a higher rental rate than a long-term rental rate, and it's lower than Airbnb. But it's more work than a long-term rental, but a lot less work than Airbnb. So again, everything, it's a little bit less work, or I'm sorry, you know, it's all this, you know, it's weighing everything, so it's the right fit for you. But just like with an Airbnb, you basically have to furnish the entire property. Um, now, I've not done this personally, and when I've looked at properties that have had operating data, like properties on the MLS or investors that are selling their properties that have had operating data for medium-term rentals, I have not been super impressed with the numbers because I'm like, oh yeah, it's really not that much more than just doing a long-term rental. Why do you want the headache and have to furnish the whole place? I mean, Joe and Jeff, have you guys, what have you guys seen about medium-term rentals out there? Because this is the area I have the least experience in. Uh, I'll go first. I, I tried to do this a number of years ago. I had a unit down in Cherry Creek or still have it, I guess, and worked with um, one of those corporate rental places where they bring in, you know, doctors or executives that need a place for 30 days or 60 days or whatever. Um, and so we furnished it and, you know, went through all the, the steps to get it approved and they kept it filled maybe 50% of the time. You know, you would have 30 or 45 day rental and yeah, it was really good. And then that person would move out of the executive rental and then it would sort of sit. I, I don't think the company that I worked with, and, and I think maybe this was an anomaly or maybe all companies are like this. It was difficult for them to keep it filled. And so you would, the numbers look great. Holy cow, this unit should rent for 1100 bucks a month and they're going to get me $2,400 a month. That's great. But it was only filled 50% of the time. So guess what? While you're getting double the rent, since you're only getting it half the time, it comes out to pretty much the same, except for the fact that your maintenance costs are higher because you got more move in and move out. And you had to spend all the money furnishing it, getting towels, linens, all the various things that go along with it. So I did not have a great experience. Um, doesn't mean that I don't know some people that do, because I know uh, a couple of clients that have rental properties in downtown and they are doing absolutely amazing with these medium term rentals. But I think it comes down to having the right uh, property manager and the right uh, executive leasing company that's filling the unit. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I personally haven't done it, but I know some other investors that have. And similar to Joe's experience, it's definitely something, you know, the upfront costs a little bit more, and you're probably going to have to pay a premium. Uh, anyways, just because it's, Usually, you know, next to hospitals or downtown is going to be a higher price point anyways. So it is, a, you know, a strategy that should be considered, but also similar to Airbnb, it's going to require, um, 
you know, a little more wear and tear on your property, a higher operating costs than just a generic long-term rental renter and just some things to consider and maybe a little bit more work too of, you know, if you're, if you're doing traveling nurses, you're going to have to fill it every three months. So just put that into your numbers or put that into your plan that you're going to have to be showing the unit um, planning, you know, there might be that little gap period of when they move out it might be like the middle of the month. And the, as soon as someone can move in is the end of the month. So you might have like a couple weeks of vacancy, just put all that in your numbers and see if it's a better fit for you and your property. But um, something, some things to consider, but it's definitely a strategy. I, I know some people definitely say it works and they get anywhere from 20 to 30% higher than long-term rental rent, rents, uh, but also higher operating costs and maybe a little bit more work too. Yeah. And the one uh, play I've, I've talked to some people where they've considered doing it or they plan on doing it. And this is one of those balances between, you know, rentals and um, personal needs. Now, a lot of times they're a house actor, they furnish it, they move out. Well, a lot of times they have, you know, parents that want to come visit or spend two or three months with them. Um, rather than living in a house, like, hey, great, I'll keep this place available for them to use two months out of the year. And that's where, hey, if you've got family or certain situations where you need a place for people to live, it can make a lot of sense because then, great, you've got a dedicated place for them. You can schedule in advance. But in the meantime, you know, bringing rental income. So there's different ways you can play on here um, just to keep in mind with medium term rentals. So again, as far as utilities, furnishings, that's something the landlord is responsible for. Again, know the rules. Uh, and again, definitely check out the HOA rules. Uh, I don't know any municipalities off the top of my head that have you know bans against medium-term rentals, but you always want to make sure you check the regulations at where you're buying and where you want to operate this. But definitely check the HOA because a lot of HOAs don't allow uh, Airbnb and some HOAs may or may not allow this. Uh, I know a lot of the Airbnb host, when they got caught two years ago and never changed the rules, a lot pivoted to uh, medium term rentals as a plan B. Um, anything else on there before we move on, guys? No. No, that was good. So the last one we'll talk about here is doing long term rentals. And when we say long term rental, this is your this is the typical thing when people talk about investing. It's a typical, you know. Uh, one tenant, one lease for 12 months, uh, and one property. So here's some very typical rents that we see around town. Again, this is not the super high end stuff in the super trendy parts of Denver. This is the common parts that we see around Denver where we and our clients are buying as house hacks and also as rental properties. Uh, so for two bedrooms, a lot of times they range between 1300 to 1600. And those are typically condos that we're seeing out there. The two bedroom houses usually don't make a lot of sense when it comes to uh, rent to price ratio. Three bedrooms are typically about 1750 to 2000. And that is where we, it's definitely a combination of condos and houses we're buying in that range. Four bedrooms are right around 2200 to the high end of 2600. Most are like 22 to 25. We've had a couple people, they, they're pulling in 2600 with their rental properties, which is great. And five bedrooms, um, they're going to a lot of times be in the range of like $25 to $2,700 a month. So I wanted to give you a broad range. So as you're looking at things, you can get a feel for what it might rent as just a traditional long-term rental. So those are the ranges we see with the rental properties we buy, whether it's a, uh, you know, a landlord rental property someone buys or a house sack, then you move out and convert it to rental property. Because obviously, if you're house hacking, you're not going to be doing a long-term rental while you live there. But after that one or two-year mark, you might be moving out and doing that. The best place to go out there and get uh, rental estimates is Zillow.com. Uh, I have not found the need to subscribe to Rentometer or any of those other third-party services. Uh, what mm -hmm. I use is I use Zillow. And if you actually a lot of times click on the property, there's often their rental estimate. Don't confuse that with their Zestimate on price. Their price estimate is still uh, very wonky, but their rental estimate for anything that's not a multi-unit, the rental estimate for single family properties, houses, condos, townhomes, is usually accurate within 50 to $100. You can see that rental estimate there. And if you close out that, that property view and just go to the map, you can go to the map and 
filter to show rental properties and select the type and bedroom range. And it'll actually pop up with active rentals on the, on the market right there. And you do a quick scan to see what similar properties are going for. So I personally use Zillow. And then once you're in a contract or we really need to figure out the exact numbers, that's where we always call one of our property managers and have them run their comps, which is often based off of using some software they have. And plus, you know, they look at rentals all day long from the, the leasing side. So they also just have that trenches, you know, that uh, uh, in the trenches type experience. And so we confirm rents with them once we get pat once we do more due diligence on the property. But for a high level, use those estimates and use Zillow.com. Utilities, it's typically a, uh, the tenant pays for them or they'll reimburse the landlord. Uh, so most people have their tenants pay for, you know, uh, trash, Excel, and then sometimes they have the tenant pay for the water or the landlord pays for the water and the tenant reimburses them or it's baked into the property. And so, but it's very common the tenant's responsible for all utilities. Plus they're responsible for all usually snow removal and lawn care. So, hey, if it snows, it's their responsibility to shovel the sidewalk and the driveway. It's their responsibility to mow the lawn. Uh, so it's usually much more hands off than the room by room, you know, short term and medium term rentals. And I can tell you from my clients for both investors and house hackers, once they move out, most people end up going with long term rentals. You guys got anything to add on here? Jeff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you, you go say first, then I'll go. <laughs> yes, I think this illustrates exactly why long term rentals are kind of like this gives you the ballpark and you could really come up to, you know, whether you're in the low range or the high range of these numbers, you could do your own research before you buy that property or while you're under, um, under contract. And with knowing this, like, okay, five bedroom, I'm going to get between 2,500, 2,700. Uh, I better look for properties. And then once you figure out how much you qualify for from Joe, you're saying, okay, I could, to make the numbers work where I'm, you know, when, if he did a nomad, like I have to find something under 400,000 for like a low down payment. So these are great starting places to then take these numbers and say, okay, let me go shop for those properties knowing this. And then I'll be able to calculate how much uh, cash flow I could potentially make or the return I can make after I move out. And um, this most likely rent by the room strategy. Um, realistically, you're not going to do it long term because of the you know just a higher like Chris said, it's there's not many property managers out there that will do that. Um, so the strategy long term will be probably just renting a five bedroom to one tenant, a family, um, or just one tenant, and that's the rent you'll get. Um, yeah, the cash flow is not as great, but the stability is nice and a lot easier from a you know, property manager perspective and uh, just a tenant perspective too. They usually stay a lot longer and it's a simple, very simple uh, standard lease, easier to understand, not as much complexities and long-term it's uh, the, probably the best strategy for all rentals. Point I want to add, um, <clears throat> we spoke about, you know, room by room rentals earlier, and now this is long term rentals. I think one thing that sometimes people will look at is they'll say, well, it's five bedrooms, um, you know, $2,500 to $2,700. But if I can rent it out per bedroom, I could rent it for 700 bucks a bedroom. Once I move out, I'm just going to rent the room that I was in, and it'll be, you know, $3,500 a month. That's probably a real, relatively realistic. But if you're planning to use a property manager, I don't know any property managers that will manage room by room rents. So if you're going to continue to do room by room after you move out, just be aware that you're going to have to manage it yourself. Um, and so it might be, again, you want to look at a conservative approach that once you move out, you're planning to use a property manager. Hey, I made really good money when I lived there and I could manage the room by room rentals, but I want to be hands off once I move out, factor in this lower cost or this lower income um, for renting the entire unit. So just be aware of that. If you're planning to use a property manager, they're not going to manage it room by room. Um, you're going to need to look at these more conservative long-term rents. 
And whenever we look at doing that, the, the long-term modeling with rental properties, and we'll do some of that in the later modules, I think it's best to always underwrite everything with these long-term rental rates. Because it's just that after a couple of years, most house hackers, they may do the room by room rental initially to help build up cash flow and get a few properties in the belt. Uh, but most people get fatigued from that and they and they revert to doing a long term rental. I know yeah, I can't know anyone that does a long term on the long term basis that does room by room rentals. Yeah, it just I mean, it's a lot of work. And and I'm, I'm speaking here anecdotally. I don't do it. But Jeff, I, it's got to be a lot of work to manage multiple multiple tenants inside of one unit, right? Yeah, well, that's where I kind of do a split. Um, I haven't done like a five bedroom house all rent by the room. It's been kind of part of it to a family, like one tenant and then the other two or three bedrooms to rent by the room to, you know, minimize how much time. Because <laughs> if I had to do all the rooms, like uh, the six bedroom house, that would be six different leases, six, uh, even assuming I stagger them, that means I'd be doing showings, you know, six months for that. Let's say I staggered them to end you know, separate months. That means I'm, you know, to minimize how people move out. Uh, I'm going up doing showings, assuming a lot of them don't renew. Uh, that's six different months right there for one property. So it's definitely, and that's not counting any future properties. So right there, you're already having that in the back of your mind. It did is more work. Um, and, but that's, you know, I'm okay with that for now, long term. Um, you know, I would want to find a property manager that could still rent by the room, but I know this is more realistic for the space and makes more sense. Um, cause eventually you're, you're not going to care as much about the pure cash flow or pure, you know, maximizing the rents long-term because you'll have 10 properties. So it won't make a difference like the accumulation phase. Sure. You're trying to hustle. You're trying to maximize everything, but eventually 10 properties, you know, you don't need to rent every single one of them by the room. And that's just a lot more wear and tear on top of that. That's yeah. something to think about. You're wear and tear on your mental well-being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so we'll just kind of end this module with what's the best method for you? That really depends on your situation, what type of property you're, will, uh, you're buying, What's your time available? What's your risk tolerance? How much mental injury you want to put towards it? So I would definitely recommend going back and you know taking to heart all the stuff we talked about. We try to give you lots of details so we could you could see the pros and cons for both. And you know this is just where you have to have a a honest conversation with yourself or you and your partner, or your spouse, and figure, hey, what's the best method for you? Because while you know Jeff may be doing uh, some room by room rental to really get uh, extreme cash flow, great. Well, as long as you can still accumulate those, you know, five to ten properties through this method, it's not going to have a huge difference in your long term retirement planning of this. So don't feel like just because you're seeing some people do one method, you need to do that. You need to figure out what's going to work for you while you live there, your work, your personal all that stuff and figure out the best method for you. So I want to thank everyone for listening to this. Uh, as always, if we can help, let us know. Uh, we got Mr. Jeff White on here, who's our house hacking coach, and he's an expert at helping get places leased up, operating the places, and all those other details with operating house hack properties. Uh, Mr. Joe Massey, he's a fantastic lender who knows uh, not only how to help you get a loan on your first property, but he understands that chess game of buying your second and third and fourth property, as we talked about. And myself, I'm an agent and I'm always happy to help people go out there and buy rental properties. So Joe and Jeff, thank you guys for your time today. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.